Number one thing that a woman withholds in a relationship or a marriage. And the number one thing that we withhold is is how your husband feels loved and respected. Your husband is not a woman. Sadly, as women, we will also drag our husbands to couples counseling. So we have to understand it as women that is incredibly important to men. And we know that. That's why we use as a weapon. And women will be the first to argue, my husband broke his vows. My husband does not follow his vows. He's the one that's not committed. Again, that is a projection of ourselves and our own lack of commitment in our marriage. But we need to be reminded this is really, really simple, okay? It's just this. It's not any of all the stuff we've made it. It's just a nice, simple, enjoyable pleasure that we can have with the one person we can have sex with, our husbands. It's a nice experience. Why is it that men have the endurance of till death do us part? And yet many women have the endurance limited to their emotions like boredom. You have to take the red pill like I did, which is simply seeing that you are the problem. As long as it's your husband that is the problem or men that are the problem, you will never change and you will stay stuck in your woman ways. And it's simple how we are the problem is that we have low emotional intelligence. We have not been taught to be in control of our emotional state in a constructive way that allows us to make conscious choices about who we wanna be and how we want to respond. It's just this. You know, even though I haven't had intimacy with a partner in six years and I have never once orgasmed with any of my intimacy partners, I love intimacy. I love being close to someone, feeling their body and especially knowing that they want to be close to me and make me want to feel loved because it makes them happy that I'm happy. There is no greater nor more intimate human experience and I feel that modernity has inadvertently decimated the importance of this in two broad ways. Intimacy is either hyperbolized or romanticized. The hyperbolizing is stereotypically there to serve men, whereas the romanticization is stereotypically there to serve women. And in all of this, there is no room for the realities of intimacy. And I think that when we are then faced with the realities of intimacy, it's confusion, it's discomfort, it's vulnerabilities and exposure, its difficulties, its awkwardness, its selfishness, but importantly, I think its selflessness. We end up being pretty horrible to each other and I have seen this manifesting itself rather beautifully online. I asked my Twitter whether men need after I was recommended a video that has recently gone viral. This video was put out by a YouTube channel and website called The Happy Wife School, run by formerly unhappy wife who, in her own words, emasculated her husband, Karen Seitz. Her channel is branded as being the red pill for women, and of course she sells courses. You can learn everything that you need to know from this, as she calls herself, happiness expert for a mere 6,500 of course, after branding herself as an expert and a happiness expert, you can find with a lot of searching the following disclaimer on her website. Karen Seitz and the Happy Wife School are not engaged in the practice of psychotherapy, clinical counseling, or any medical practice. You should not interpret any part of my videos as traditional psychological, medical, or emotional therapy. Karen Seitz is not a licensed health professional. You should seek help for any specific psychological, medical, or emotional problems with a mental health professional or qualified physician. This after in her videos she denigrates these professions and their methods. Sadly as women we will also drag our husbands to couples counseling, convince the therapist of our story of how our husband mistreats us, the therapist buys into the story because they're not trained to see it any other way, and then they falsely accuse the husband of being a narcissist. The, the concept of interdependence it's like I said, it sounds great, but like, of course, that's how a healthy relationship needs to go. And of course, that's what it needs to look at. But here's the problem with it. 
This is another therapy model that is taught in a classroom and then tried to be transferred over into teaching this in therapy or couples therapy but there's no practicality to it. Today, I wanna to talk about a video I recently came across from Esther Perel, who is a world-renowned relationship expert and couples therapist, where she talks about the biggest reasons that a relationship fails. Quite frankly, she gets it all wrong as many relationship experts do. What I find interesting about Karen's courses and her website as well as her general message is that she continually stipulates that genuine change and happiness not just for you but in your marriage and relationship with your partner is found exclusively within you. She typically uses herself as an example of this in that she found the answer to improving her marriage within herself not within modern and conveniences like feminism, therapy, meditation, etc. However, interestingly, the way that you are going to find the change within you is via her and her $6,500 course. Something doesn't align, but that is the gist of everything that Karen Sites stands for. But I think the Happy Wife School represents something both fascinating and daunting about our modern conversations and relations to sex. Number one, Patriarchal societies and norms aren't compatible with modernization. Now, I'm not one of those women who believes that you can blame the patriarchy for everything. In fact, I don't believe in the patriarchy at all. I am a feminist, but I'm not a political feminist. I am a philosophical feminist, which means that I am a devout follower of Simone de Beauvoir, and that is basically the only feminism that I refer to, that of existentialist feminism, the writings of Simone de Beauvoir exclusively. So I don't believe in this idea of the patriarchy. Uh, I know a lot of modern feminists, or at least from second wave feminists onwards to the present, don't subscribe to a lot of what Simone de Beauvoir says, mainly because of something that she said in The Second Sex, which is that women are partly responsible for their own oppression, that they often choose to feed into this idea of being vulnerable, of needing men for their advantage, and because patriarchy or because being oppressed or under the oppression of men serves them in many ways and that this is something that women have to reconcile themselves to something that they have to um, fight against if they so wish it's something that they have to deal with and that it is something that women have to deal with on their own there are very philosophical as opposed to political undertones to a lot of what Simone de Beauvoir wrote and had to say about women and feminism and that is obviously no fun the beauty of politics is that you can blame everybody else for everything that is wrong in your life whereas with philosophy you only have yourself to really blame and therefore you have to be the source of your own self-discovery or your own liberation as it were it's a lot more difficult it's not as fun and of course as humans we typically look for the easy way out so when i say that we have as a result of choosing modernity we have abandoned patriarchy i mean that quite literally i don't believe Believe that we live in a patriarchal society anymore we live in a modern society we live in a modern and increasingly i suppose postmodern society and this is because of a theoretical choice that was made i think it is a choice that is not necessarily a choice that we've wholeheartedly made but sort of just the way that the course of history has happened in predominantly modern western societies that of modernization and ironically modernization was was largely pushed by said historical patriarchal men as a way in which to induce progress as an extension of themselves in the world, in the material world. And as a result, workers had to specialize in skills. They had to become better at a particular specialized skill and trade. Increasingly, workers had to learn to read and to write. And I think most importantly and crucially, children of both sexes were increasingly seen not as little adults but as children distinct from adulthood. Modernization increasingly exposed that children had to be protected from the harsh realities and the harshness of adulthood and in this it wasn't just adults that needed to be educated but increasingly so the universal child had to be educated and this wasn't just boys but also girls and increasingly women and girls 
girls going to school, learning how to read and write, became women and girls of all social classes going to university. It morphed into women taking on roles within a modernizing workforce. A workforce that, due to modernization, created new, diverse roles and required more workers, more minds and more bodies. Without women working, a lot of the modern industries, professions and services that we take for granted wouldn't be where they are. But there is a lot of clear frustration that particularly young men are experiencing in this post-patriarchal society that we live in. This post-patriarchal society that is now very much so a very clear-cut modern society likes to sell things to its consumers. Whether that be selling them the myth that patriarchal ideals can be readily realized and are compatible with modernization, or whether it be selling the myth that it is possible to get back to a point in which patriarchal society and mores reigned supreme. I think in the name of whatever you define as progress, a trade-off was made. And to be fair, as a woman, I think that this trade-off was a very good one. And I think that inevitably, during times of tumultuous change and alterations in social fabrics, in the way that people understand a world that is very much changing in the Western context, where we don't really have any spiritual underpinning that unifies and unites all of us under an idea of where we should be or what we should be striving toward. It is no wonder that we are frustrated, that we are angry, that we are disillusioned. And so I think that this is that time of change that sadly I think Gen Z is the generation that is going through it the most and uh, the worst. So that is just the first point that I wanted to make. A first point that is this idea that we are living in a modern society as opposed to a patriarchal society. I don't believe that modernity as we know it and as it has been realized is compatible with patriarchy and with this idea that the patriarchy reigns supreme. The patriarchy serves political feminists as the same kind of boogeyman that feminism serves to the red pull, that feminism serves to a lot of political figures today who are trying to find a very easy and clear-cut explanation and excuse for why everything is amok and wrong. Number two, we don't take sex seriously. Do pardon my rather artistic appearance, but I am on my way to a roller disc and my sole objective is to attract as many butch lesbians to me as possible. In this video, I'm going to be addressing a question or a more so declarative statement that I have been seeing online quite a lot recently. I don't know if it's just because of the cold weather and cold season that is making people seek warmth in the arms of others, but it is a thing that is happening and it is something that intrigues me and I think is very important to speak about because I think it is leading us in into territory that we otherwise would not intend, but I also think that it is leading us into territory that is very counterproductive and counterintuitive to what men and women yearn for and want most, which is for somebody to see them at their most vulnerable, for somebody to see them at their most authentic and as their most authentic selves. And I think that one of the most vulnerable and most meaningful ways in which another person can can validate and see us authentically and honestly is through the act of intimacy. And the declarative statement that I've been seeing incessantly online as of late is men need physical intimacy. Now, of course, I can do the very, very typical video essays thing of breaking down each word of this, but I think we can get the gist of this. The idea being perpetuated and that is being claimed is that intimacy, physical intimacy is a necessity for men. And the underlying idea of this is that in the modern age, modern women, specifically young women, and specifically women who have been married to a man for a prolonged period of time, are purposefully withholding physical intimacy from their male partners as a way of either controlling the relationship, controlling the man, because women are seemingly innately sexless or have less Yes. 
pleasure or less need for pleasure and desire that once a woman traps or gets a man into her pesky little claws she has no incentive or interest in being intimate or physical with her male partner and therefore this argument has its main uh, followers or its main advocates in no doubt and of course the red pill how often do you expect sex because because a lot of people have these ideas in relationships and it's different than marriage so i'm curious from your point of view to me and this is going to sound a bit wild but i just don't ever hurt don't ever expect her to say no if i want to have sex Mm. that is the deal that we've made is as being married and you don't want me to do it with anyone else then that's what i should do and that seems to work Literally on demand is yeah. what I'd say. I think it actually just comes down to so. the guy. Sometimes he just wants to. F- he's just he's stressed. He needs to release that energy, and he's gonna. And the wife is his release. Mm. So at that point, it needs to be on demand. Cause if the guy has a build up, he wants to release it. Well, I mean, you can't like I can't turn on the water faucet on demand. You know what I mean? Then give head. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not sure with this one because after I've seen a girl for a while, it tends to be her who's always wanting it, and I'm a bit like, uh. I don't want to be there's like... A, there's a reason oh, for that, Oh, that means though. that she's attracted to you. That's good. There's a reason for that, though, because scientifically, men's sex drive declines as they age, whereas women's increases as they age. Now, as I've tried to make clear on this channel, I am not a red pull woman at all. I do not believe that we are going to find any meaning or happiness in coddling what has become a very resentful community of predominantly men, young men, and I I also don't think that we are going to find any answers, nor any meaning, nor any explanations in blaming all the ills of the modern world, valid ills of the modern world, on one group of people, which always, and has since the beginning of history, always been woman and specifically young woman. This easy and I think very lazy explanation has done nothing for men nor for society. Since the beginning of time, it hasn't resolved anything because inevitably you're not going to resolve anything by looking for an explanation that is not an explanation. But I think we also need to appreciate that being adults and being human beings and specifically modern human beings means that we have to appreciate that we are not always going to get what we want and that life really is not as simple as we like to imagine it is. And this most definitely includes physical intimacy. And you know, I think the very puritanical and I would argue the male-centered notion, and I don't mean male-centered in a negative sense, I mean male-centered in the way that it is often the burden of men when it comes to this idea that sex is something that you just know, that it needn't be learnt, that you needn't necessarily even communicate about it because it is just an innate thing that inevitably, as I said, men or the male-centered individual knows and will always know. We have therefore neglected the very important thing about anything that involves being a human being and progressing through the days of our lives, which is that we are constantly learning, we are constantly unknowing, and we are constantly being exposed to new things about ourselves, new things about our abilities and capabilities, and we have to do the grueling work and effort of trying to accommodate that very fact about ourselves, and sex is no different. Since the 1960s, we have been living in a very particular zeitgeist, which I think can be summed up as follows. We have two extremes of sex. On the one hand, we have sexual liberation, which at least since the 2000s has really become a matter of sexual liberation equating to the increased positive commercialization of sexuality and sexualization. By commercial sexualization, I don't just mean the obvious things that we see today, such as the proliferation of and the positive or increasingly positive connotations associated with female empowerment, meaning and equating to sexual empowerment and being far more sexually open and sexually positive. What I especially mean is the entertainment value that is increasingly being associated with sex. Oh my goodness, my breath is showing. I feel like there are dementors gradually approaching this room. Sex is seemingly everywhere. 
you see it in everything. You see it on social media, you see it in advertising, you see it no matter how hard you try to avoid it. But this sex is entertainment. It is there to attract an audience, to attract especially a male audience in order to make money and make profit. And therefore it isn't necessarily what it is often equated to and what I think we often take for granted. This idea that our increased exposure to sex, to the physicality and the physical aspect of sex equates to sexual education. And I think this is a problem that we have, that we have seen sexual liberation being almost made synonymous to this idea that it is sexual education. The most obvious example of this is how overwhelmingly young people inevitably seek out sexual education via explicit content online. The lack of resources or meaningful resources surrounding not just the dangers of having sex and STDs and STIs, but very importantly, the thing which most people would like to, I hope, associate sex and intimacy with, which is pleasure, which is showing love, which is reciprocity and the most intimate and most vulnerable form of communication that the human body and mind can possibly fathom and do. Explicit content creates a very false perception of pleasure, what it means and how you can identify it and how you can achieve it or allegedly give it to another person. And so naturally, considering that my argument throughout this video is going to be that sexual liberation most definitely does not equate to to sexual education, I am delighted to be introducing you to today's video sponsor, Beducated. I would like to dedicate this small section of the video to Beducated because I think it is so vital and so important. Based on all the information about the decline in physical intimacy between men and women in the modern world, because of the greater polarization between especially young men and women in the modern world, and because we are so so incredibly lonely and miserable in the modern world, which I think has a great deal to do with this lack of intimacy, this lack of communication, and I think most importantly, a lack of empathetic or sympathetic, rather, understanding of men and of women, not just as individuals, but also as sexual and objectified individuals. And that is where Beducated comes in and why I would really like to stress that over the past few months that I have personally been using Beducated, I started off being incredibly embarrassed, incredibly unamused, feeling that I personally did not need to know or learn anything about physical intimacy, about my body, let alone men's bodies, to actually being incredibly overwhelmed with not the information, but with my own emotions and my own, I think, arrogance uh, when it came to intimacy, when it comes to actually communicating with a partner and actually thinking about intimacy as something not to be ashamed of, not to be embarrassed about, but to be something that is as important as cultivating any skill and especially cultivating it with somebody who is significant to you. Beducated is an app that basically brings sex-based education right to your bed Bedroom. And this is not just for individuals who have partners, who are married, who are divorced. This is for anybody and everybody, including a femcel like myself. And I'd say that personally, this is why Beducated has been so beneficial to me. If you've been on this channel, you will know that I have great shame and great trauma when it comes to physical intimacy, when it comes to my body, my physicality, how I look, how I feel. It is a whole situation. Beducated world of top sex experts, of sex therapists, of educators who are there in order to actually educate you on pleasure, on intimacy, on anything and literally anything and everything that you may want to know about intimacy, about your body, about your partner's body is an 
absolutely brilliant and perfect resource, irrespective of gender or sex orientation. I am not kidding when I say that you can access over a hundred courses, over a hundred videos and quick lessons on this app. From dealing with rejection to online dating specifically curated to help or to explain things about the modern dating landscape, about women and modern women to men, to understanding sexual orientation, to online dating for women, all the way to overcoming vaginismus, which is something that I and many women have and will experience in their life, in their sexual lives. Beducated is truly a resource that is there to help and guide you empathetically and informatively. Personally, my favorite course was hosted and curated by intimacy coach Libby Shepard. Her course was on female masturbation and I can tell you that I have not masturbated uh, before this. Uh, it was something that I was incredibly uh, ashamed of, which is a very common feeling that women have. It's something that I have always sort of found to be... <sighs> I don't know. I think I've just always really distanced myself from my body and because I don't perceive myself as pleasurable and still most definitely don't perceive myself as desirable or pleasurable, it is not something that I therefore think to myself while well, I deserve pleasure or want to give myself pleasure because I mean ill. And so this course was very, very difficult for me but it was also incredibly eye-opening for me and it made me treat myself a lot better as a person it made me discover my anatomy in a way that I never presumed possible and it also made me and informed me about what an absolutely incredible and I mean really incredible awesome and I mean in the biblical sense awesome thing the female genitalia truly is and how absolutely diverse it is with all its nerve endings with all the information that I just learned from this course about myself it was really so helpful and so different to be able to learn about intimacy without it being about getting off. And this is the thing that I love about Beducated. It doesn't hide anything. You see everything. You are exposed to everything. You are exposed to information, to visuals of bodies, of human bodies, of real human bodies with the objective of educating you. And I think this is so incredibly vital and so crucial in our day and age. A day and age in which we are bombarded and oversaturated with explicit content that is just meant to get us horny. So during this holiday season and for a limited time only, why don't you give the gift of better communication, of intimacy, of love and of confidence to your loved one or to yourself because you most definitely do deserve it. You can get full access to Be Educated for an absolutely phenomenal 40% off. That is the equivalent of 80 US dollars in saving, locked in for life. And I can tell you if I was fortunate enough to have a partner, this is most definitely something that I would give to them. And it is something that I will, when I do one day find a partner that I will give to them because there are some brilliant resources on Be Educated that I would love to share with somebody, such as exploring different sexual positions with them, having them choose one one day or me choose one another day and entertaining ourselves. What fun and anticipation would that be? So if you want my unique and truly amazing discount code of 40% off, use my link showing on screen right now and link down in the description, as well as my specific coupon code, which is Kidology, in order to reap the full benefits of Be Educated, which I can assure you I have been and will continue to. You also get a one day completely free trial as well as a 14-day money-back guarantee. So I'd just like to thank Be Educated for sponsoring this video. I really wholeheartedly appreciate it more than just them agreeing to collaborate with me because I really wanted to collaborate with them and spread the word and the message but also because it really means something to me personally as I will be showing in the remainder of this video. So Let's get back to it. The very harmful assumption that men need sex. Now, I was very interested in the results that I got from asking some of my Twitter followers whether they believe that men need sex. When asked, do men need sex? 52% of men said yes, 
whereas only 29% said no. And of the women who were asked, 6% said yes, whereas 13% said no. In my opinion, for men, sex is so important because it is the way that they feel validated. It is the way that they are able to actually bond and connect with somebody. Whereas I think that with women, we have far more avenues for feeling validated, for bonding and connecting with other people. I think we are permitted that connection to intimacy from a far greater spectrum of people and experiences than men are. On the other hand, I think that male sexuality and pleasure has been something that societies from the beginning of time have taken seriously and have prioritized above all else. Whereas female sexuality and desire and pleasure is something that not even in our modern context people willingly take seriously or even are willing to try and understand. In that I think you have your answer to why sex is perceived as a need for men relative to it being seen as a need so much for women because of the fact that a good fact on the one hand women have found and are able to and are encouraged to find other avenues for affection, validation and seeking and finding womanhood, whether that be in friendships, in family relationships, in being good motherly figures in society or just being mothers as well and connecting and bonding with their children, etc. And a negative component, which is a component that I think contributes to a lot of the increasing disconnect that women and men are having among each other other, which is that our desire and us as beings with desire and pleasure is not taken seriously whatsoever. The happy wife school exemplifies this perfectly in everything that she has to say about her assumption that women don't enjoy sex and that it is therefore an obligation and a duty for us to enjoy sex even if we don't want to have sex. Sex is how your husband feels loved and respected. Your husband is not a woman. He is a man and sex is incredibly important to a man and it's where we miss each other. And, and 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 just go totally different ways as 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 husband and wives a running thread in this whole video that vexes me so so much and why i really implore any woman who may think that this is the answer to never ever take advice from this woman please i beg of you to never if i have one thing to say for the rest of my life it's to never take advice from Karen sites please save your money save your time save your integrity and your self-worth please do not she makes these declarative statements these declarative statements that sex is number one on a man's list of priorities in a relationship where it will be number eight or ten for a woman she makes these statements but she never says why and she never asks why There is no curiosity at all. There is no sort of understanding as in why sex may be a way in which a man feels respected and validated. But why isn't this the case for women? Why is it that sex may not be number one thing for a woman? Of course, I don't believe that it is the case. I think that she is living in her own sort of reality about sex based on her own sex drive and her own experience, which is all well and good, but I think she should clarify that as opposed to generalizing her experience in order to make statements that are very, very harmful. And what happens is that uh, we begin to treat our husbands like Neanderthals and that there's something wrong with them, that sex is so important to them and we want, want to change them and make them so wrong for just who they are as a man. I think we get somewhat of an explanation from two sources from the perspective of woman. 
especially. I think the one source is looking at what is called the orgasm gap. When you look at the orgasm gap, it is quite significant and it is quite telling of something that I think nobody really wants to talk about because we have no means of very honestly and seriously talking about sex, at least no means that are actually promoted. But in some, the orgasm gap is as follows. 95% of heterosexual men orgasm basically every single time they have sexual intercourse, whereas 66% to 65% of bisexual and heterosexual women respectively orgasm. Now this gap most definitely is not as large as it was even 10 years ago. 10 years ago I believe it was at about 75% and I'm sure as we go back in history it was probably far far bigger than that. In comparison when women self-pleasure themselves they orgasm 95% of the time and the gap is closed. Now I'd say that the obvious reason why the the orgasm gap closes when women please themselves is because women know or get to know their anatomy through self-pleasure and through discovering their bodies. And in this way, we take our bodies seriously. We take our pleasure seriously and we understand what gives us pleasure. Yet a common experience with women was put very well by Louise Perry in a recent debate about the sexual revolution. We don't really live in a free sexual culture. Right. I mean, Sarah talked at the beginning about women in the past, um, before orgasms were invented, <laughs> having painful unwanted sex. Women are still having painful unwanted sex. It's just having painful unwanted <laughs> sex. Like, that's basically the only difference. I'm serious. Like, the number of teenagers who are having, like, thoroughly miserable sexual experiences in the name of liberation is astonishing. I think we've basically just seen a flip. It used to be they were stigmatised for being sluts and now they're stigmatised for being prudes. It's the same thing. Women, especially young women, are having bad sex and have bad sex. And this is all because sex is just not taken seriously. Sex education is not taken seriously at all. Sex is the one thing where people assume that you just know what it is and it'll just work out and that most definitely is not the case. When you consider how terrible young people are increasingly proving themselves to be at communicating with each other, how incredibly polarized we are becoming from one another, it is no wonder that we are also having less sex and that when we are having sex we are having pretty miserable sex, especially on the part of women. You chose to get married and, and you made vows and you made a, com a commitment to your husband, you took on the role and responsibility to have sex in your marriage and enjoy it as a part of a healthy relationship. Everything that Karen Seitz says about enjoying yourself, about having an obligation to enjoy yourself, is completely antithetical to the very experience of being a human being. This makes absolutely no sense. And this is actually one of the stupidest things I have ever heard in my life. And it pains me to call a woman who is older than me and whom I ought to respect stupid, but this is really so stupid, very stupid. And it is very telling to me why her comment section of this video is 99.9% .9 disgruntled, angry men who are resentful of either their wives, their partners, or of the woman who they believe they should be entitled to have sex with, and not a single woman who is agreeing with her whatsoever. You know, I like to think of this as an analogy to something which I love, which is roller skating. I'm a very passionate roller skater. I've been roller skating for well over five years now. And what I've noticed in seeing other people start roller skating and doing roller skating is that the majority of people will start it and be very enthusiastic about it. And then they suddenly stop or they gradually lose enthusiasm for roller skating and I never see them again. Now, why is this? Based on the sort of idea of reality and of woman's desire that Karen Seitz has, her explanation would be that these former roller skaters 
skaters just didn't like roller skating, but that they must roller skate and they must enjoy it. It is their duty because they signed a contract with the roller skating rink that they must enjoy it and that they must roller skate once every single day, that they must be enthusiastic participants in roller skating, even though they don't enjoy it, even though they are not having fun when they're doing it. Now, there are a plethora of reasons why people who formerly roller skated no longer roller skate. But in my mind, just based on what I've seen over the last five years, it sort of boils down to one very obvious thing when you think about it. I don't believe that people stop roller skating because they don't enjoy roller skating. They stop roller skating because something is preventing them from enjoying roller skating. And what that typically boils down to is their roller skates. When people see roller skates, they just see, well, this. When I see roller skates, I see a barrel bushing, a top bush cup, a kingpin, an axle, a top bushing cap, a barrel bushing, my truck, or I guess in the US you call them a hanger, my conical bushing, my bottom bush cup, my bottom bushing cup, my kingpin nut, my toe stop, my jam plugs, my axle nuts, my nuts, my bolts, my bearings, my bearing spaces, my lace hooks. I see all these individual parts that need to be eventually customized to my foot, to my needs, and to what makes me feel comfortable and what makes me a better skater. And I kid you not when I say that this has taken me years to get and to understand. I work on my skates at least once a week because I need to adjust them to how my feet are feeling that week. Sometimes my feet are a bit more swollen than usual. Depending on whether it is winter or summer, my feet need added support. My ankles need less or more support. If I'm skating at the skate park, my ankles need less support. So I have to change how I've laced up my boot. I have to change which lace hooks I'm using. I have to change my hanger or my trucks depending on what surface I am skating on. And this is something that I think is not appreciated. This is something which falls under the umbrella of education, under the umbrella of the tedious stuff that you need to know in order to make the activity itself, roller skating, or in this case, this is an analogy, sex enjoyable. Because for instance, when somebody stops roller skating because they have a traumatic fall, which is what commonly happens. Somebody falls on their roller skates and it's traumatizing. It really is. Similarly to how somebody can have a bad sexual experience and it traumatizes them. And like with the roller skater who falls, they decide to stop doing it altogether or they can't bring themselves to do it, which is a very natural bodily and physical response. It isn't something that anybody should be shamed for, a roller skater or a woman and sex or what have you. But the explanation is is not that given by the happy wife school that you just don't enjoy roller skating, that you just don't enjoy sex as a woman. And this doesn't just apply to roller skating. This applies to anything and everything that we as humans do. A lot of our experiences are determined by the arsenal and the tools that we have as well as the environment that we are in. Honestly, knowing the difference between a 101A and a 78A wheel has transformed my life and I believe that it would have transformed so many roller skaters' lives. And I just give this elaborate analogy because I think the happy wife school falls into this trap. I think she conveniently falls into it because, well, it's how she sells her courses. But I think that a lot of people, not just her, but especially her audience, fall into this trap of perceiving women not prioritizing sex as therefore meaning that women don't enjoy sex. That our desire works so antithetically to men that sex is a need for them, but seemingly not a need for us in terms of bonding and connecting and loving and feeling loved by someone. We make it very, very clear. You cannot have a healthy marriage. You cannot have a healthy relationship if you are not having sex with your husband or you are shut down to sex and doing it as an obligation and a chore. It's not okay. And, and you can't have a healthy relationship, relationship or a healthy marriage from that place. We all know sex is part 
of a healthy relationship. And this is the other thing that I just find absolutely mind numbing about this video and about everything that our dear friend, ugh, what's her name? <laughs> Karen Seitz is saying, not once in this video does she make what I think is a crucial distinction between sex and good sex. And I think this is something that is missed from all of this because of this thing that we do, which is to prioritize male desire and male sexuality in, well, everything. That is all well and good, but if we want to have relationships with each other, if we want to have partners who we can be intimate with and can have loving, healthy relationships with. We need to not prioritize our desire exclusively. We need to think about the person that we are with and we need to prioritize their desire as well. It is completely antithetical to all reason that a woman would want to have sex with a man when that sex is bad. Who on earth would want to do that? Who would want to have sex that is painful? Who would want to have sex that is traumatic? I can tell you that when I have had sex, oh man, the things that I have done in order to please a man is um, very degrading and very humiliating. Something that in no way makes me feel like I'm being respected whilst having sex. Something that makes me feel like an object that has made me bleed. And I think our culture, especially for young women, means that these are things that we are expected to do. Having bad sex, having uncomfortable, having explicit content like sex is deemed as something that a woman just has to put up with. A woman just has to do. Women typically when they are having intimacy with a partner fall into one of two categories. I'd say that this is more so young woman. I've definitely fallen into both categories. On the one hand, you have sex with a partner and you believe that it will get better, that it will get better as you get to know each other more, as you get to understand what having sex with them is like. And so you have hope that the situation sexually will improve, that it will get better because it is just an obvious thing that sex is not going to be great all the time or that, you know, you're not going to be in the mood all the time, like, you know, the mood in your own head, like that you're totally in this, whatever. Life is hard, life is complex. On the other hand, you are so enamored with somebody, you love them and they are such a wonderful person and they show you such care, such affection, such, you know, kindness as a human being, or they are your partner who you just love and adore, that even though the sex isn't brilliant, you can overlook it. It's not something that is a deal breaker, exactly. And I do think that most women fall into one of these two categories for at least a part of their journey to self-discovery sexually. And I don't think that this is a bad thing, but I do think that this is a telling thing of how communication is so difficult. I think as women, we are definitely taught not to express such things. I am definitely very ashamed or embarrassed by my sexuality, by the fact that I'm a sexual being. And the idea of speaking to any of my previous male partners about my sexuality or telling them that actually I didn't enjoy that, I didn't orgasm from that, would have completely destroyed my will to live as a very young woman. And it is because we are scared. It is because we are scared to voice such things. It's because voicing such things is not something that a woman is meant to do. You're meant to just fake it and women are very good at faking it. But I think that things are improving in the way of the orgasm gap are telling that things are hopefully improving and that they will start to improve and get better. And that's the sad reality of sex with your wife is that she used sex to get married and once she trapped you, there was no reason for sex anymore. The sad fact is that a good man or after a woman marries a good man, all he's good for is being a sperm donor and for financial security and all the facade of being into you, of being passionate about you, of loving you and can't wait to get together to be with you. That facade drops because we got what we wanted. And for most of us as women, when we become disinterested in sex and we stop having sex, we will hold on enough 
to string you along. So that's where we'll have sex once a month or twice a month. And we'll string you along for that financial security and or for having children. And that was sadly my experience. I can tell you factually, women and self-please themselves as much as men do. They really do. As a girl who was in a South African boarding school, and even though I did not know what was back then, I now know what it is, and I now know exactly what was going on in my boarding school, I can tell you that uh, it was a frenzy. Women, and especially young girls, learn from a very early age, from either their parents or from society at large, that female desire is either a myth, that it's something that should be counted or suppressed, or is just something that we should be ashamed of. This is sort of the remnants of this idea of hysteria, which has, regrettably, still found itself very much a part of our lives today. As such, according to Karen Seitz, female desire is definitely not a need. This is categorically false and this is something that people are very uncomfortable with. A few days ago I made a tweet and the tweet was as follows and you can read what I said as well. I'll put that on screen right now. But what I found most interesting about this tweet and the responses that I got was that not one man who responded could actually answer my question. And of course, I don't blame men. I don't blame men for this. I don't blame young men for this. We all have our problems. We all have a lot of things that we are going through. All I am trying to say and what I was trying to say was that if we want to have meaningful, healthy sexual relationships with each other, we have to put in the effort. We have to put in the time. We have to communicate and we have to understand the bodies of the other not just the generic body, which was ultimately what my tweet was about, more so just even the generic body, which is like the bare minimum, but the specific body, the specific woman's body, the specific male body, etc. I can tell you that women, including myself, yearn for desire, sex, and intimacy just as much as men do, just because it manifests itself in different ways, at different times, in different contexts. It doesn't mean that it isn't there. It doesn't mean that women don't have pleasure, don't want that pleasure to be met. I can assure you we do think about sex, love, intimacy, pleasure constantly as well. When we have sex from a place of obligation or as a chore, we feel used, we feel resentful if we're doing what we're supposed to do. That's a wonder, actually a wonderful example of being nice is, is doing sex to, to check the box and and say done maybe i bought myself a week or two and then shutting down that's not okay in a marriage it's not that's a, a cruel cruel way to treat your husband who is a man in which this is very important to him. How are you meant to enjoy sex and enjoy a healthy relationship when you're not having one? One of the main reasons for women filing divorce is because of something called unreasonable behavior. Now, when you look into the examples of unreasonable behavior, I found it very telling and interesting why the following was listed. The most common examples of unreasonable behavior are as follows. Domestic abuse, excessive or lack of sex, unreasonable sexual demands, inappropriate association or relationship with another person, debt or financial recklessness, verbal abuse, shouting or belittling, social isolation, excessive or lack of socializing and drunkenness. Now what I found very interesting was unreasonable sexual demands as well as excessive or lack of sex. Now all of these in my opinion represent something that could really be deduced to a lack of respect. It's interesting how in a marriage or a relationship it's about cooperation, it's about mutuality, reciprocity. Why is it that a man's respect is the thing that is paramount but respecting a woman is not? Why is it that you have to have sex with your husband or your partner and enjoy it even though they may be making unreasonable sexual demands on you, even though the sex may 
may be painful, even though your partner may not be interested, that you as a woman have a cervix that is constantly moving, that you have hormones, which mean that your desire and that your sexual drive is altering quite frequently, that you may be on medication, whether it be antidepressants, for instance, or HRT drugs, or on birth control, which alters your hormones incessantly. If you are in a relationship or a marriage which has any facet of unreasonable behavior, how are you meant to enjoy having sex with your partner when they may be abusing you, when they may be harming you, when they may be isolating themselves or isolating you, where they may be exhibiting antisocial behavior? If somebody is verbally abusing you or belittling you, how are you meant to enjoy having sex with them? So much responsibility for a marriage and for a partnership is burdened, and I mean burdened on woman, when a relationship is not meant to be a burden. It's not meant to be something that is associated with duties and responsibilities, but something that is a partnership. It's teamwork. You work together, you compromise together, you make decisions together. One thing that I find really interesting is that in all of this that the Happy Wife School is saying, there is no consideration of something that I think is often just taken for granted about bodies about women's bodies. A modern woman's body is meant to be a vessel of pleasure for her partner. It is meant to be a vessel of life for carrying children, for giving birth to children, for feeding children and nourishing children. It is meant to be a vessel for modern society to thrive as a tool and resource for modern society in the workplace. And it is meant to be a vessel of housekeeping and house maintenance in the way of doing most of the household chores and labor. Our body is put through a lot, and I mean a lot. And this is something that I have noticed, especially with young men online. I wouldn't say young men in the real world. I do like to distinguish between the internet and real life. I know a lot of people don't like to, but I have faith and hope. I think this is something that is taken greatly for granted. The real trauma that our bodies go through throughout the days of our lives. And I think it's, you know, a phenomenal thing. It's absolutely phenomenal what our bodies can do, what our bodies are made to do. But it is also something that is so fragile and I think is really not respected in that way. Just as a side note, I just know in my comment section I'm going to get a lot of very upset men saying, yes, but what about men's bodies and just because I'm talking about women's bodies it does not mean that I am comparing them to men's bodies. I think a big problem that we have in modern societies is that we do not take men's sexual health seriously at all either in terms of prostate and testicular cancer, in terms of prostate health. It's really something that is neglected and not taken seriously at all until it happens. So please just understand that and just because I'm talking about one thing it does not mean that I completely disregard or don't care about the other thing. So that is all I have for you today because I cannot endure any more of the happy wife school and at least based on the comment sections I am thrilled to report that the majority of women can't endure her either. This kind of red pull content is of course very popular at the moment but I do implore you to really be very critical of all and any content coming from somebody who presents themselves as an expert and clearly isn't and somebody who presents themselves as an expert on something and just gives you declarative statements without in any way showing a modicum of curiosity as to why that declarative statement is being put forward. Thank you so much for watching this video. Thank you to all of my patrons. Thank you for all of you just being here and listening to me and a big thank you as well to Beducated for sponsoring this video. And please, I do implore you to look into Be Educated and to subscribe because Be Educated is an absolutely phenomenal resource and is one that we are in desperate and dire need of in this day and age. You do not need to spend $6,500 for 
expertise from a woman who is telling you that you need to enjoy having unfulfilled painful sex with your partner because that will make him feel respected and like a man you deserve to have a pleasurable wonderful sex life with your partner and you can get that from a one day free trial of an absolutely phenomenal app and from sex experts who you can find for free on this very app but anyway do tell me what you think down below and i'll see all of you very very soon in the next one